Hello, everybody, and welcome to SPUI 25. Welcome to this roundtable on gender and sexualities under attack in Central Eastern Europe. My name is Lina Duits. I'm a social scientist specialized in gender and sexuality, uh, but today I'm here uh, as your moderator. Um, we see more and more that conservative forces frame gender and sexuality studies, queer studies as a dangerous ideology. Um, in the Netherlands, small right-wing parties speak about the gender ideology as a harmful propaganda tool. Although I have no idea what this single one gender ideology might actually entail. Um, in Central Europe, we are witnessing the devastating consequences of such demagogy. Um, critical social sciences, critical, critical humanities are under attack there. Um, in Hungary, gender studies uh, was removed from universities uh, and the Central European University was expelled. In Poland, ethno uh, ethnology and cultural anthropology are no longer registered as academic disciplines. Today, we are going to hear from scholars that are right in the middle of this. I am very pleased to announce that we have here today with us Hadley Redkin, Agnieszka Kocinanska, and Thomas Bashuk. Uh, they are here um, with us, uh, and uh, uh, you will be uh, seeing them uh, and hearing them. Um, so all speakers will start with a short opening statement. Uh, and then after that, we're going to do two sessions. One is going to focus on the causes and one is going to focus on possible solutions. And I'd like to encourage you all uh, at home. I cannot see you, um, but you can see me. I'd like to encourage you all to send in your questions. Um, you can do that all the time. Uh, use the Q&A uh, um, uh, possibility uh, on the bottom of the screen uh, and post your questions uh, there. And then I'll be sorting uh, through the questions and I'll make sure uh, to post them to our honored panelists. Um, our host today is Spuy25 uh, in collaboration with the Amsterdam Center for European Studies. Um, and uh, this roundtable is part of the ACES lecture series, Gender and Sexuality in European Geopolitics. Then it's uh, time for me to uh, introduce our speakers in order of appearance. First, you're gonna be hearing from Dr. Hadley Renkin. He is an assistant professor of gender studies at the Central European University. His research focuses on post-socialist sexual politics and their geotemporal histories. His most current book is Disorientations, Queer Politics and Geotemporal Belonging in Hungary's Post-Socialist Conjuncture, which is an in-depth ethnographic study of Hungary's LGBTQI plus movement. After him, we will hear from Dr. Agnieszka Kostinjanska. She is the Leverhulme Visiting Professor at the Oxford School of Global and Area Studies and an associate professor at the Department of Ethnology and Cultural Anthropology at the University of Warsaw. She writes extensively on gender and sexuality, and this January, an English edition of her monograph, Gender, Pleasure and Violence, the Construction of Expert Knowledge of Sexuality in Poland, came out with Indiana University Press. Welcome also, Agnieszka. And then last but not least, we have um, Professor Dr. Tomasz Paszczuk, he teaches uh, the American Studies program at the University of Warsaw. He is author and co-editor of several books about contemporary American fiction and life writing, queer studies, archives, and oral history. His most recent book is Americans Gay, American Gay Men's Life Writing Since Stonewall. Um, so um, as I said, um, all our speakers will give an opening statement. And again, please, to those um, watching, feel free uh, to put your questions in uh, the chat so I can post them to them in the panel sessions uh, uh, after this. Um, so Hadley, I'm going to give the floor uh, to you. Okay. Um, thanks very much. I hope everyone can hear me. Thank you, Linda, um, for the introductions uh, and for inviting us here today. Um, I think what, I, what I'd like to, to say to start out is to really briefly highlight some of the deeper reasons 
why not only gender and sexuality themselves, but knowledge about them and the question of who controls it are such particularly powerful sites of cultural and political struggle in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, what I'd like to raise very briefly here are the deep historical roots of gender and sexuality and expert knowledge about them as means of marking borders and hierarchies between Eastern and Western Europe, going back to the Enlightenment. Um, just as a, a couple of examples, one historian, Larry Wolf, in his famous book, Inventing Eastern Europe, talks about how in his visit to Russia, Casanova uh, employed as a set kind of sexual slave and servant, a 13 year old Russian girl, describing her as a passionate creature, but also a savage creature, ultimately uncivilizable and treatable only as a kind of sexual slave and servant. Um, similarly, Wolf talks about how both Voltaire and Diderot had a kind of tutelatory romance um, with Catherine the Great as a queen of uh, a potentially great region of the world who had to be taught the gentleness of enlightened rule by truly enlightened male scholars. Um, and thus, Wolf argues that gendered and sexualized encounters both embodied and secured the hierarchical relations of power and knowledge that established the difference between Eastern and Western Europe. Um, another potential example is some work I've done. Um, I've written elsewhere on folklorist and psychological anthropologist Geza Roheim, a Hungarian folklorist and psychological anthropologist who used the fields of folklore, psychology, psychoanalysis analysis and anthropology to instrum instrumentalize gender and sexuality as key sexual scientific markers of fundamental natural differences between Europe's East and West. Talking about folk myths, folk tales, folk stories, folk behaviors um, as uh, in the East as abnormal and perverse and non-modern and thus as ways of um, describing how a certain kind of perverse, non-modern, primitive gender and sexuality persisted in the East. And what I'd like to note about this deep history, not only that it's fascinating and important, but it's important precisely because these kinds of scientific histories have, I think, contributed to making not just gender and sexuality and their politics, but the very question of who studies and knows them, a kind of critical site for both the transnational bridge building that followed 1989 in Central and Eastern Europe, um, and the local, regional, and nationalist politics that were so resurgent then. Um, and I think we could perhaps argue that, that this has similarly been um, a resurgent phenomenon re-emerging after uh, critical period moments like 2004 and 2008. And, and this is true for both um, the ways in which both visible LGBT movements and events such as Pride and things like the presence of gender studies programs in these regions, as well as right-wing oppositions to these have become powerful civilizational markers or indices of geotemporal belonging. And then of course this, is this and this history makes these ongoing critical sites of transnational organ, organizing for these politics because of the ways in which they're tied into the relationship between East and West, between national and transnational, between local and global. And again, this happens on both kind of pro and anti queer slash feminist sides. Um, and this affects the ways in which um, these forms of politicking involve statements about very complex moral and political relationships, both on the level of kind of the imperial and colonial, whether they're neo or post imperial and colonial hierarchies, but also in terms of the very old mutual and mutually constitutive fantasies that they evoke. On the one hand, fantasies of noble heteronational savages and degenerate to moderns. And on the other, enlightenment, enlightened tolerant moderns, as opposed to fearful and hateful sexual gender primitives. So this is, I just want to kind of lay out this, 
geotemporal mapping to argue that, that these are very old relations and their political meanings are therefore at once old and extremely powerful and potent, full of meaning, symbolism, tradition, in terms of thinking about what it means to take certain stances on gender and sexuality. And again, in terms of shaping the knowledge of it. Um, I, I, I won't say anything now about potential counteracting strategies with which we might confront these. I'll save that for our discussion. So I'll just leave it with a question for Agnieszka, which is, so, you know, with this history in mind, um, what you think some of the various local points of specificity or convergence and divergence are in the more recent histories of this process? And how have these shaped different forms and meanings for, for these local and global entanglings and for the manifestations of this, this gender and, and sexual struggles? Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Well, talking about more recent history, perhaps it's good to map how this whole thing started, that how the attack on gender and sexuality studies started in countries like Poland or Hungary. And I think that these are really similar histories given the time uh, when everything started. So basically doing gender and sexuality studies was never in Poland or elsewhere, it was always a little bit suspicious. So if you are a sex researcher, everybody thinks there's something wrong with you. But I had, from my experience, I can say that it got normalized at somewhere around, I don't know, 2010 or so. And it became quite natural that you do gender studies. And then suddenly in 2013, it just appeared from nowhere that everybody started to talk about gender and gender studies in Poland. And that there is this thing, um, as Linda said earlier, of the ideology of gender that is responsible for demoralizing children, for this is something that is not a real science, but a new form of communism or fascism. That's, you know, and the, the, major, the major aim of this ideology is to destroy the Polish family and the Polish nation. And we gender studies scholars are responsible for, for this total, uh, you know, degradation and demoralization of, uh, of Polish children. And for instance, Polish Episcopate, uh, Polish bishop discuss, I mean, on a, during the official meeting, is uh, Judith Butler a threat for, for the Polish nation? So that was all happening in 2013 and 14. And of course, the major aim of, uh, 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 because gender studies, uh, Linda said earlier that anthropology was uh, was banned as as was is not longer registered as uh, as an academic discipline in Poland. But uh, for instance, gender studies as such never never really existed as a separate uh, academic discipline. You you cannot have uh, a PhD from gender studies or even MA from gender studies in in Poland. So, uh, but. Still, there were a lot of people doing gender studies, and then you can study gender studies as a, some kind of postgraduate non-degree program. So, but so, but this this was, I think, quite marginal move, quite marginal mm, milieu of gender studies uh, researchers. But what was really visible for people was uh, sex education. So the major attack on gender was on sex education as this space of demoralization and, and this space of, of uh, education about gender equality, sexual rights and uh, uh, sexual orientation, tran uh, transgenderism and all sorts of things related to, um, in a way related to sexuality and gender. So the major attack was on, on sex education and uh, uh, and I think, and it's still going on. Polish, uh, the Polish Parliament debated this spring during the uh, the full lock. We were all in full lockdown, and uh, and the Polish Parliament debated uh, the to total ban of sex education in Poland as something being uh, something being uh, you know demoralizing for for children. So, but but when we talk about history, so then we can of course say that it starts in 2013, 
But if you think about those, and if you think who's involved in those attacks and how they are being, how these issues are being framed as the certain nationalistic uh, idea, certain idea about the Polish nation, then you can track the genealogy from at least early 20th century uh, in the debates around uh, pornography, in debates around uh, around sex education. So, for instance, when there were first attempts to establish sex education in Pol uh, in uh, in Poland in the early 20th century, there were exactly the same arguments that this will demoralize children. And of course, everybody wanted some kind of sex education, but not necessarily the education which is based on uh, on equality or on some kind of redefinition of uh, of gender roles and some kind of you know sexual uh, reform as it was called uh, during the interwar period and then later under under state socialism also there was a lot of pressure from the catholic church to ban any forms of progressive sex education and even uh, uh, when this finally got into schools, a handbook, a progressive handbook was just shredded after two months and kicked out of schools. And this, of course, got more intense in, during the post-socialist period because of uh, really strong international links uh, and also radical, and there's there was a lot of radical rights activism appearing in Poland and going into, uh, going into, or sorts of ally alliances with Polish uh, anti-sexual activists. So I think that there is there's a really strong, uh, there's really long history of this kind of attacks and linking them with linking gender and sexuality with 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 uh, with national identity and with and that there's this question if if a if a genderist a person doing doing gender or a person who of non-normative gender or sexual identity could be a true Paul, could be as somebody really uh, fully committed to the nation. And of course, the question is, the answer is no. I mean, the, the, the conservative answer is no. So, so I think we should, we should see uh, the attack on gender studies and on sexuality studies in, uh, in the context of this long history and long, long development of, of these arguments that are being recently also strengthened by, by international, transnational collaboration of, of conservative anti-gender anti uh, activism so, so we, which we can which we can because we see quite similar uh activities all over europe latin america in the us and uh, of course in the former former soviet union so then so then so then to just we can think and this is this is a question to to thomas so what can be done how can we counteract this uh uh, this attacks on gender and sexuality studies, or or, the, or talking more broadly, those attacks on gender equality and uh, sexual rights. Thank you. Uh, thanks for this. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, well, I think that um, there is not uh, an easy or a simple answer necessarily. I mean, uh, of course, one can. Uh, make uh, the argument that there is need for sexual education at schools and that uh, there is need for uh, gender and sexuality studies at universities and so on and so forth. The problem is that uh, politically that kind of argument doesn't necessarily uh, prove to be effective in, in, in many cases. This is really the situation that we are now facing. And so uh, it seems to me that um, uh, that there are uh, at least two strategies that in fact uh, do work and that, that, that have been adopted almost uh, unwittingly by people doing gender and sexuality studies uh, because they simply are a continuation of strategies that have been adopted earlier. You mentioned uh, Agnieszka that uh, in your sense uh, maybe around 2010 there was a kind of sense that that sexuality studies and gender studies is already um, something that is just very good, that is normal, that is accepted. And I think that you're quite right. I mean, I think that uh, 
that if you go back another decade, uh, if you go back to the late 90s or early 2000s, then, then it still was a very strange thing to be doing. And, and uh, um, just to uh, use an example that I know because I was involved in, in, in this particular project, one of the first uh, queer studies conferences in Poland took place in 2000 and I was one of the organizers. And uh, one thing that we thought of doing at the time was uh, not to attach it to any single public institution. So we had three different universities uh, um, which organized this particular conference. And uh, one reason that we did it this way, I mean, there, there was more than one reason. We also wanted to uh, you know, source funds from the three universities and so on. But, but one reason was that we realized that we could be shut down quite quickly and quite sw swiftly by any single university, but if we had three of them involved, then uh, they would be looking at each other and they would be hesitant, our chairs or our you know, heads of universities would be hesitant to shut us down. And that seems to have worked. And we've kind of stayed with that strategy for several years. Uh, and in some ways we still do it, uh, we still use it. For example, um, the same group of people um, uh, set up a uh, queer studies journal called Interalia in 2006. And we, we, we decided at the time not to, again, not to affiliate it with any single university. Um, and that has, with time, led to uh, some problems for us, technical, bureaucratic, and also financial problems. But nonetheless, it, I think, has saved the journal from being kind of, uh, you know, taken over or uh, stopped uh, possibly. Um, so, so, so this kind of strategy that you might say is a strategy, strategy of cunning and also a strategy of diffusion uh, seems to, uh, to, to work. It's not the perfect solution maybe, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's useful to point it out. Um, it's a broader strategy uh, than just the examples I provided. For example, uh, again, Agnieszka has already said this, uh, gender studies uh, or sexuality or queer studies is not, uh, they're not academic disciplines in terms of Polish bureaucracy. Um, um, moreover, uh, there are no gender studies departments. There are some departments that have gender in their names, but it's usually added to something, to a longer list of words. Um, there are no uh, curricula, which are exclusively gender studies or sexual or queer studies, uh, except for some very small postgraduate programs. Um, and so you cannot get a degree in gender studies, for example. Um, and all of this is uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, sign of weakness. Um, on the other hand, it also kind of perversely uh, makes it more difficult to eliminate uh, the presence of gender and queer studies from university curricula because it's uh, the, those things are just spread, you know, all over. Uh, um, and um, the research is also spread all over. It's done in various departments. It's done in uh, anthropology, of course, in cultural anthropology. It's done in you know, uh, art history, sociology, Polish studies, English studies, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so, so this is this is both a weakness and a strength. But I think it, it, it even though we didn't necessarily perhaps all think of this as a strategy uh, uh, from the get go, it has become a kind of strategy, and I think it's an effective one. And secondly, um, uh, the, 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 this goes back perhaps more to Hadley's remarks about the East and the West, uh, Eastern Europe as a kind of constructed eyes of the West and vice versa. Um, I, I would say that, that um, um, in Poland specifically, I know Poland better than, than other East European countries, um, uh, the authorities responsible for education and higher education seem to be torn between wishing to uh, work towards uh, strengthening of what they see as uh, core national identity, what Agnieszka was pointing out, uh, which is frequently defined as homophobic and so on. Um, uh, but at the same time, they wish to, uh, or they aspire to be just as effective in some ways as the West, uh, just as uh, prominent, just as uh, legitimate in terms of the research being done, it's, so we have this uh, recently introduced uh, point system for publications, uh, the way that research is evaluated, this kind of 
uh, tied uh, in with uh, publications, uh, primary publications in the West, uh, publications in English, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so all of this uh, really presents a kind of contradiction because you cannot have both at the same time. And so uh, the other strategy that uh, I think works besides the one of diffusion is that of internationalization. And this uh, is especially important, I think, in terms of uh, funding research. And uh, Agnieszka and I were involved in a hira funded project for uh, three years uh, doing research on the queer 1970s. Uh, this was a project that took place in Poland, but also in the UK and Germany um, and Spain. Um, and uh, it seems to me much less likely that, that a project like that would be funded by the Polish government or one of the agencies which fund research in Poland internally. Uh, but if it's done on an international uh, level and with, uh, with the use of the same money, I mean, it's still government money, including Polish government money, but because it's not just the, the Polish national agency that decides, uh, it's just more likely that, 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 that gender and queer studies uh, uh, may get funding. Uh, I'm presently involved in a similar uh, application uh, 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 that's submitted for a Polish and German uh, source of funding rather than just Polish. Uh, th th there are some funding agencies in Poland uh, that, that fund research, which, which are more clearly kind of uh, already appropriated by the current uh, right-wing regime and others are not. Uh, but I mean, in, so I'm not, I'm, I don't want to suggest that every single funding agency in Poland that funds research is already uh, uh, um, sort of politically ill disposed towards gender studies. That is not actually accurate. But, uh, but, but, but it seems to me that, that, that it kind of as a general strategy, this you know, going international, uh, um, because it is in line with, with one of the government policies uh, can be uh, a way to move forward. So maybe this is enough for now. Uh, and Hadley, I am curious if I may ask uh, a question of you, um, whether you think that the you know, very, very painful problems which uh, Central European University has been experiencing, it's um, effective expulsion from Hungary. Um, to what extent do you think that is to do with uh, the questions that we're addressing today? In other words, uh, gender and sexuality studies. We understand, of course, that uh, there are other reasons that have to do with uh, with the founder, with, with George Soros and so on. But but I mean, I wonder if, if gender and sexuality play the role, do you think? Well, Hadley, before you start, um, uh, let me just say we're opening the panel now. So we're going to talk amongst ourselves now. So again, a, a call to people in the audience. If you have any questions, uh, please um, post them in the in the in the Q&A. Uh, a box uh, uh, underneath your screen, and then I'm going to let you answer, Hadley. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, thanks, Tomas, for the, the question. And Linda, maybe I can use this as a way of getting into sort of a round of discussion of expanding our thoughts on what the causes of this problem might be. Because, yeah, I think, Tomas, what I would say is, is as you mentioned, that it's really critical to think about what's happened to Central European University in Hungary and to gender studies in Hungary um, in relation to the broader politics of knowledge that's going on there, which is, as you say, on the one hand, it's part of a kind of national resistance project um, to what are perceived as aspects of economics, politics, knowledge, but also sexual and gender politics that are coming from a, a transnational realm, whether it's the EU or a kind of imagined West. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's important to see these in relation to this broader politics of knowledge, which is also about sort of control of people's sense of national identity their sense of national history, their national memory. So the, the, the way in which Central European University became a site for this struggle and then a university that was eventually expelled and now we're in Vienna, 
um, for the most part. There are still some small parts of the university that are in Budapest, but for all intents and purposes, most of the university is in Vienna. Um, and, and the way in which gender studies became, I don't know, a, a, a particularly salient point in this larger issue are part of a, a much broader seizure of the means of knowledge production by the Hungarian government. So the Hungarian government has basically taken over control and direction of almost the entire university system as they've taken over control of most of the media, um, et cetera. Um, they've privatized in government directed corporations. Um, most of the universities now, they're just extending this to universe, universities outside of Budapest. So there's a much larger project of, of control of knowledge um, and on the one hand, doing what you're saying, the Polish university system is doing, which is sort of playing this international status game and using these techniques uh, of a global, global techniques of, of a global status. And on the other hand, trying to reshape a kind of nationalist perspective to the educational system. Um, gender studies became a particular, a particularly, uh, uh, loaded um, element of this, um, really a means of um, accessing public outrage on certain issues um, through this idea of gender and sexual, sexual politics as kind of ideologically powerful and threatening issues. Um, they ended up not banning gender studies but as in Poland, simply removing gender studies from the list of officially approved disciplines so that it became impossible to officially register a gender studies program. And Central European University had the only actual department of gender studies where you could get a degree in gender studies, but there were a couple of programs as in Poland, programs in gender studies at Hungarian universities. And so all of these became basically impossible to run. But I think what you're suggesting Tomasz, about potential avenues for resistance to this, as you're saying has happened in Poland, in Hungary, there are still people who taught in these gender studies programs in Hungarian, univer Hungarian universities who are now going to teach their perspective in a course that's perhaps about something else, in a program that's no longer called gender studies, but perhaps it will diffuse through the rest of what they teach. And I agree that that's a can potentially I, very powerful tool. Can I interrupt you there, um, Hadley? Because we're gonna talk about um, solutions uh, uh, in a bit, but first I'd like to dive a little bit deeper um, into these causes of what actually sort of to try uh, to figure out what exactly happened there. And I thought it was very interesting what you said about there's this, um, uh, there's this sentiment. Uh, so there's a sentiment, uh, uh, maybe a populist sentiment as well. Um, um, but um, uh, tying into what Agnieszka was saying before, that um, it really also was an attack on um, sex education. Uh, and I often get the idea of when we say it's an attack on gender studies, I tend to focus on the studies. So I think that people have an issue with sort of the epistemology behind gender studies, like the way that we, what, that we practice these kind of uh, um, uh, disciplines within the social sciences or in the humanities, that people have a problem with that. So my question um, maybe to Agnieszka is, um, is this something, is it, is it actually about the studies part or is it about, the, is it about the, the, the gender and the sex part? And also, is this something that um, came bottom up uh, uh, from, from you know, people in the street that are actually angry about this? Or is it very much a move made top down by governments? Well, I don't think it came from the people on the street because people on the street just didn't didn't know what gender is. I uh, I co-edited the first reader in anthropology of gender, which was called Gender and Anthropological Perspective in Polish in 2007. So that was really not well recognized term. Just just you know six seven years before the whole conflict around this started. 
So, so I wouldn't say it came from from people on the street, but it rather was a part of broader mobilization against certain pol political uh, project of equality and uh, also gender and sexual equality. So I. I don't think that this is really about studies because uh, gender studies are mostly they're very often based on very elaborated uh, uh, theoretical concepts which are you know familiar to a small group of people having their PhDs in uh, in humanities or social sciences so I think that this is this is something that really goes beyond uh, uh, you know political conflict but it's rather about as you said sex education and uh, and of course the istanbul convention uh, you know there was a lot a lot of this discussion was related to to the idea of you know P poland ratifying the istanbul convention more or less the same more or less around the same time and the ter the very term gender appears in the istanbul convention and it was presented as some kind of uh, convention that would be against uh, against the Polish family because the police could intervene in the in uh, you know in the in the um, instance of of domestic violence. So so I think that there is a lot. To, so this is not so much about studies, and of course it is about studies because you, universities are part of uh, part of broader. Uh, broader, uh, you know, concept of national education. So to this extent, it is about studies, but it's rather about uh, not concept itself, but that we at as university professors demoralize students with <laughs> with our neo-Marxist uh, ideas, as this is being called. So, so, so I think this, this, this is, this is. So, I would say that gender ideology and the attack on gender ideology, uh, it's in this context, gender ideology is this really, really broad umbrella term that covers everything, covers academic gender studies, but also sex education, uh, sexual rights, all sorts of uh, gender and sexual activism, um, all sorts of activists ag against sexual violence uh, and gendered violence. And 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 of course, in the Polish context, also just just um, around the same time, we have we had the first uh, trans uh, uh, MP in, uh, in Poland, and I think that was a lot of concern related to that. That that then the whole idea of uh, uh, trans uh, gender transition was was also discussed a lot in the uh, on the radical right. So, so I think that was also one of the reasons, but but then it's really far away from from gen, actual gender studies. I can see that Hadley really wanted to add something. Uh, Hadley, go ahead. I had a thought, unless Tomas, you want to say something, but I had I had some thoughts about that. But go ahead. Go ahead, please. Okay, I mean, I just wanted to agree with Agnieszka that this this whole question of you know is this kind of an opportunistic manipulation by politicians of people or is it a populist popular sentiment um it's really quite complex i think you know on the one hand there are these terms like gender as, as you're saying Agnieszka, that um that don't mean a lot to people but they they then become these sorts of symbolic representations of something that uh, you know a sense of identity and location this kind of geotemporal belonging to people and they can then be used to mobilize that kind of sentiment. But they're actually, I think in order to do that, it, there has to be some sort of sentiment, a sense of anxiety about geotemporal belonging to begin with, to be accessed, right? Similarly, I think that, um, you know, the, the, the concerns about sex education that then get connected to concerns about the Istanbul Convention or an LGBT movement. Um, you know, these are both concerns about, you know, something that is poorly understood perhaps, or, or you know, people aren't aware of in terms of terminology, their new meanings, but they attach to very old meanings about normality, 
and respectability. And I think it's precisely this combination that, that makes us so loaded, just like there, just as there's this very complicated relationship between sort of a, a, our ideas of what's global and what's local here, um, where you know there are these global connections, the Istanbul connection, the idea of gender ideology is something that flows with feminists and queers from the West, um, et, et cetera, but versus a kind of nationalist populist sentiment. But then there's also, we know there are right wing Christian, homophobic, anti-queer, anti-feminist fundamentalists coming from the United States to Budapest, right? And bringing together Christian right wing homophobes the World Congress of Families, for example, to Budapest in order to kind of stimulate this sentiment. So it's a very complicated set of relationships that's making this happen. Sorry. And um, Thomas, you've studied uh, uh, American culture uh, extensively as well. Do you, do you agree that this is a, a conservative transnational movement that, that, that is operating here? I think it is. Yes, yes. I um, I think that um, um, you, you see this sort of uh, anti-gender uh, rhetoric uh, in the U.S. Certainly, you also see it in some places in Western Europe. You know, France has had a, a movement such as you know like, like that, uh, for example. Uh, so, so it's clearly uh, international, and I think Hadley is correct to point out that that there is. Uh, Kind of material connections that that obtain uh, exchanges of ideas of, of strategies uh, information flowing back and forth no question that there is uh, a kind of mobilization uh, also at the international level there um, yeah um, also i mean another another kind of uh, point of uh, of note perhaps is uh, this is this goes back to uh, a point like this comment in passing about you know, Judith Butler being positioned as a kind of enemy of the people, if you will, which which sounds strange, maybe, but uh, but but it, uh, I mean, the way in which that does make sense, I think, is that uh, is that um, you had uh, misreadings of Butler's uh, you know social constructivism, uh, um, uh, especially after Gender Trouble was published, and as we know, of course, she followed up with Bodies That Matter, partly uh, trying to perhaps correct the misreadings uh, um, in, in the sense that uh, people began to read, some people began to read her argument as, as being about uh, gender as something that is, that is just voluntary, that, you know, that people can, can kind of you know, uh, put on and wear and so on. And uh, this is perhaps the way that uh, you know, Pope Benedict has read Judith Butler, as we know, he studied her uh, too. And, um, uh, and uh, to me, the way in which the term gender in the sense of gender ideology is being used by the right, at least in Poland today, is precisely to do with that misreading. In other words, uh, uh, what, what I mean, the fears, quite literally, the fears that, 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 that are being kind of mongered by uh, some on the right uh, have to do specifically with the threat to the gender identity of very young children. Uh, so this is sometimes described as a kind of forced sexualization of children, uh, but I think uh, it's not really about sexual activity so much as it's about uh, how they might be caused to, uh, you know, identify or not identify with their uh, with their genders. Uh, so yeah, I think Agnieszka is raising her hand. So. Uh, Agnieszka, yeah, you wanted to, you wanted yeah, to... Yeah, just, just very uh, briefly, because I think those transnational links should be also, but I think we should see both transnational links that are definitely there, but also local genealogies. And you can see the same, the very same people now uh, attacking gender that were involved in discussions on sex education back in the 1980s. So, so you can really see the same people, the same organization. Of course, there are new people joining them, but there is certain tradition of mo mobilization around this uh, topic through through concepts like like sexualization of children or demoralization of children. 
uh, that that they were there even before Butler and before the misreading of her of her work. And and I think that those transnational links they also go back historically. That that it wasn't like this that during the Cold War there was no exchange between the East and the West. And uh, and even back then uh, those conservative uh, conservative links were already there and there were there were certain you know materials being sent to this and forth and uh, you know the use of them were made on both sides um i i have a question coming in from the from the audience that um is some, somewhat uh, related uh, to that um this is a question from uh Stuart chen chen um and they are wondering um about the polish context um, uh, they write, I have read from social media, something like that Poland is the highest ranked EU member state for women entrepreneurs, according to the popular MasterCard index. Um, so what are your thoughts on, on this kind of discourse? So this is, is, this is, of course, a kind of different feminist uh, discourse. Um, maybe, um, I don't know, Agnieszka or uh, Tomas, can you say something about, because it's about Poland? Well, I can say that broadly speaking, I think all, uh, I mean, this this is a heritage of state socialism and uh, that, you know, there was a huge mobilization of women into the labor market uh, all over Eastern Europe. Uh, and I think this is something we still see uh, today, not to such an extent as uh, as it used to be, that women are involved in, in business. So I wouldn't be surprised uh, that this is what, what happens. I don't know, it, was that the question about this? <laughs> I, I think so. Um, just to round this first session off on, on these um, causes, um, I wanted to ask you, Hadley, um, because you work for the Central Euro European University, are you personally uh, under attack as well? Uh, does, it, does it affect uh, you and your, your everyday life? Well, um, thanks, thanks for asking. Um, honestly, so in one sense, yes, of course it affects me personally. My university has been forced to move from one country to another, from one city to another, from, you know, if you like, simplistically, east to west. Um, and so in that sense, of course, it's been enormously disruptive. Um, in another sense, no. This is this is perhaps close to what you meant. No, I'm not personally, as far as I'm aware, under attack. If there's any hate mail out there, I haven't seen it. And so that's fine with me. There are professors in our department who have gotten that kind of response, who have gotten hate mail, um, who've gotten threats. But as far as I'm aware, I haven't. Um, and, I, you know, to some extent, this connects to what I think Agnieszka was saying, which is that, you know, honestly, there's a, there, we can perhaps make a distinction between how a discipline like gender studies or a gender studies department as a, you know, an actual academic institution becomes a political instrument mobilizing all kinds of sentiment um, with certain effects and how that actually impacts or you know what that has to do with the actual department itself because um you know in gender studies like most academics we live in a relative bubble um we talk to our students we talk to our colleagues you know we go out we talk to activists and others we hear and we see things but that's not impacting us the same way that the politicization of this idea of gender studies is if that makes sense. So, you know, in that sense, I'm affected and I'm not affected. Um, it was also, I have to say, another way in which I was personally affected is living in Budapest. There was a palpable tension, particularly in the last 10 years since Fides Orban's party took over in 2010 when things began to get really bad, um, you know, in a much more serious way. Um, th there was a deterioration of public mood, which affected the things that people talked about on the street and that affected 
right? And that included things like people saying things about migrants, people saying things about queers, people saying things about feminists. So there's a number of ways in which, so maybe to draw a parallel with what Tomas, you were saying about diffusion of gender studies knowledge and queer knowledge. Well, there's also a diffusion of anti gender and anti-queer knowledge into the everyday. And I think it's really important as an anthropologist, I think it's really important to think about, you know, this level of, of these phenomena as well. Thanks, thanks, Hadley. Um, so to move on to the to the to the second part, let's talk about solutions. Uh, uh, Thomas, you already alerted to uh, uh, to some of the strategies that you're employing, um, uh, uh, um, uh, combining universities, working working together. Um, I think for um, at least people in the Netherlands, and this is also a question coming in from the audience, um, coming uh, from Lisa Mucha, um, what can we do? What can we do to support you? Um, who wants to pick that up? Maybe Thomas? Well, thank you for this question and, and for the, you know, for the, for the uh, I don't want to say the offer, but, but the, 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 the willingness to, to reach out and help. Um, and, Yes, I mean, I, I'm really glad that we're having this discussion and, and I'm, I'm hoping to hear ideas, uh, you know, new ideas uh, 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 that would also be in response to, to Lisa's question. Uh, but but well, I've already talked about internationalization. I mean, it, I think it's one of the crucial uh, strategies that we need to uh, follow. Uh, there are dimensions to it, which are, uh, which kind of go beyond, uh, you know, simple, pragmatic uh, uh, choices in terms of funding, for example, for research, uh, but, uh, but that have to do with strengthening the EU uh, uh, ties with, uh, you know, with between the East and the West, which, 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 which is something that, that of course is currently under threat for, for a range of political reasons that I don't think I need to go into, but, 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 but uh, uh, a conversation such as we are having and, and other such conversations and other projects that, that people uh, uh, carry out together, including, you know, simply writing an article together and so on, that, that would, uh, that, that, that I think does, really does go a long way. I think it's, it's, a, it's a crucially uh, important uh, um, solution, if you will, or, or uh, uh, a crucially important thing to be doing. Um, uh, I, if I can, if I can kind of go off on a tangent for just a moment here, uh, one of the things that I am saying, this is really also about you know strategic responses and and solutions, or perhaps they're not solutions in the end. Um, uh, one of the things that I'm observing in Poland currently is the very different ways in which universities respond to the situation that we are discussing, and what I'm thinking of is. You know, heads of universities or university senates taking a position in public, um, and on the one hand, we have uh, a woman who is uh, head of uh, the other Mickiewicz University in Poznan, who took a very um, public stance, uh, protesting against attacks on gender, uh, and um, and and she has been very vocal in this way, and she kind of uh, what what she in fact did. Uh, or in effect, what she did was to define her own position vis-a-vis -vis her own university, the university that she's running. I think she kind of uh, wished and, and in fact set a standard, a kind of benchmark for what she will accept and for, you know, will not be, will, for what will maybe be on the pale for, you know, for as long as she stays at the helm. Uh, but this is unusual. And what happened in other universities, including the University of Warsaw, which is where uh, Agnieszka and I uh, are, uh, is, uh, and this has actually uh, been true also for the previous uh, um, set of people who are in charge, um, they're much more cautious. I mean, they will sometimes take a stand, but, but, but in fact, they are trying to not take a stand as much as possible, uh, trying to negotiate uh, a kind of sense that the university must remain neutral, that there is place for debate, that of course certain things will be beyond the pale, but, but, but people can have completely radically opposing views when it comes to certain topics, including gender. Um, and so uh, so this, is, this is a different strategy and it's a more widespread strategy, it seems to me. 
um, so I, I don't know, you know, I don't mean to suggest that one is better than the other. One sounds better, uh, one may be better uh, in a kind of immediate uh, effect, but uh, of course the reason that, uh, that other universities are being cautious uh, is because they don't want to, those people don't want to lead to a kind of uh, internal uh, split within the university. They uh, want to preserve a sense of uh, we're all in it together. And, um, and I don't mean to say that they are, you know, kind of openly homophobic or anything like that. That's not that's not the case. But there is there is there is certainly a kind of sense of caution in the air. And this perhaps is also what Hadley uh, was referencing in his uh, in his remarks. Uh, so I yeah I mean. Um, I'm not sure how to connect this to the West, <laughs> if you will. Um, that doesn't seem to necessarily obtain for uh, uh, the university done in communication with in the West. But 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 that is a, a kind of reality on the ground that we are now uh, facing, and it's not always bad. I mean, we do have the support of those people on many occasions, uh, but they will not be kind of vocally, uh, you know, protesting uh, against uh, uh, people who are anti-gender, for example. And Jeska, you wanted to um, add, I think. Yes, I wanted to answer to Lisa's question. Uh, Lisa, thank you for this. So I'm thinking that perhaps what, uh, if you are asking what you or the University of Amsterdam could do. So I think that this is mostly support for, for the uh, youngest generation of researchers and PhD students or even MA students. Uh, and things like uh, student exchange, postdoc opportunities, that the space for safe space for young researchers that they could, you know, come for a semester and write or attend a summer school. So I think this this kind of this kind of standard academic exchanges, but with a special focus for for people, for young researchers doing, uh, doing gender and sexualities in, I know, Poland, Hungary, uh, or other places where these things are perceived as kind of suspicious, that would be a great help to for them, I think, not only on academic level, but also on an emotional or psychological level to spend a semester where this, in a um, environment in which these things are discussed in other atmosphere. Thanks, uh, Agnieszka. So, um, Hadley, I know you want to you want to add as well, but I, I also have a question, uh, uh, especially for you, um, because the solutions that uh, we've heard before uh, are on a very practical level. But this is maybe a bit on a more conceptual level. A question to you, Hadley, uh, coming from the audience from uh, Gregors, um, and they're asking, um, Hadley brought up the item of gender studies being perceived as part of a broader and vastly rooted myth of global versus local, modern versus traditional, and being attacked as such. Uh, for instance, the tension between the LGBT movement and uh, Catholic movements in Poland is playing at hand in these dichotomies. And then the question is, would a deconstruction of those concepts and of dichotomy communication be a solution? Because right where queen could possibly exist, right? They say, kind regards. Yeah, thanks. Um, great, great question. Great point. I completely agree. And I, I think, you know, this is the work that a lot of us are doing who are working on these issues. For me, this is the point of a kind of what I call a post-colonial approach to these issues where you try to show that, you know, this is a historically constructed set of relationships, myth, as you put it. Um, and if we can show the way that that's been constructed and that it is a sense of construction of that sort, then perhaps we can deconstruct some of its power. Um, I think the problem with that is that it takes a fair bit of time and sort of conceptual knowledge already to, um, to work through those genealogies, um, those histories, uh, in order to, to do that effectively. And part of the problem is that it's precisely the means of a attaining and undertaking that knowledge that are the subject of struggle here. And one could perhaps suggest that that might be part of the reason why they're the subject of struggle. I mean, I don't think it's any coincidence that it's disciplines like 
cultural anthropology, gender studies that are really um, the most targeted disciplines by these kinds of governments. Um, again, it's not necessarily about gender per se or culture per se, it's about a certain kind of critical thinking about things we take for granted, about things we take as natural, um, that makes it, um, makes it possible and indeed necessary to kind of question the sorts of manipulations that these authoritarian governments um, like Orban's uh, or the current Polish government are, are engaged in. So I, you know, I think that's really true, but that's precisely the, the trouble. And you know, I would say that perhaps a good way to achieve that, even in a situation where disciplines like cultural anthropology and gender studies are being, again, not banned, but sort of erased, right? Vacated, evacuated, right? Um, is, is to consider, again, going back to what Tomas, you said, to consider that maybe the way to fight is through diffusion um, on the one hand, right? That we take those lessons and we try to put them everywhere so that then maybe they're less visible, but in their very invisibility, they're more prevalent. They're everywhere. So I'd say that's one thing to do is to, to, to follow this politics of diffusion and politics of invisibility. But the other thing I would say is, is to pursue connections. Um, because I think that, and again, I think Thomas, you were saying this, that, that we need to build connections both across national borders, right? People struggling against the Polish government and the Hungarian government and the Turkish government and the US government, right? Well, okay, the previous US government, but you know, the US right wing. If these movements, if anti-gender, and anti-queer movements are transnational. Well, then we have to fight them too by building transnational connections. And we also have to build other kinds of connections. So one thing that the Hungarian LGBTQ movement has done is try to, you know, in response to the last 10 years, is to try to move beyond the kind of usual boxes of, of distinct separate identity politics movements um, and to try to, build bridges between queer and Roma and homeless and feminist movements who are all caught up in this mix of politics. So I, I guess I'll stop there. And so I know that Agnieszka wanted to um, uh, respond to that. I also say that uh, we're moving towards the final questions. So uh, if you in the audience want to be your question to be the final question, then uh, uh, please do not hesitate to still send it in. Uh, and I'm gonna let Agnieszka now um, respond to Hadley. I just wanted to maybe develop a little bit on a practical level what you were saying that about, you know, deconstructing those the big narratives and big concepts. Because in, in my research on the history of sex education, what I could see that on the one hand, there are those two camps that being really divided with a very strong uh, ideological boundary. There, there are two camps, there, there are those progressive people and these conservative uh, uh, groups and they struggle over these things. But, but this is one level. And, but on the other level, there's always a space for dialogue. And this dialogue, with, which happens, I know, in schools and publishing houses on debate during var various uh, public uh, uh, events, so that people could, at some point, agree on some things, although they they would uh, theoretically belong to opposite camps. So I think that we should also think about building um, uh, building alliances with those who are not so obvious allies and, and finding the spaces where this thing should be, should, should be discussed. So, so I don't know in the recent uh, situation in, in Poland with the abortion ban, there was a huge involvement of, of uh, people who self-identify as Catholics against 
the abortion ban because a lot of Catholics would believe that perhaps, uh, you know, making the state to follow the strict Catholic rules is not the best way to, to be a good Catholic, just to obey rules and not to believe that in them. So I think that there is a lot of a lot of spaces for dialogue also around gender and sexuality that you could find this middle ground, uh, uh, not only in our bubbles, but away from them. Thanks. Um, thanks, Agnieszka. Uh, and then um, I have a final question from the audience, from Simone Schneider. Uh, and uh, they're asking, uh, well, they're saying, uh, first, thanks so much for the interesting event. Um, then I would like to ask how students on different levels of education manage and seem to perceive these developments and attacks on gender and sexuality studies, especially in relation to what Agnieszka said, said about the benefits of student exchanges. Um, Thomas, could you could you shine a light on that maybe um, to close to close off? I'll be glad to. Thank you. Uh, so, of course, uh, I, I suppose that my perspective on this will be skewed by uh, the kinds of students that I have contact with. So. Uh, I think if you go to uh, a school of engineering, uh, where perhaps most students are male and so on, you, you will have a different uh, impression. But uh, my impression, and I have been teaching, you know, queer studies for about 25 years now on a off in Poland, and uh, uh, is that is that uh, there is there is a kind of growing, not just a growing acceptance, but it's just something that a lot of my students see as completely uh, normal. Um, we have, uh, you know, we, I mean, we, 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 we don't have a situation that I remember from the, uh, say, mid-90s where were to offer a course in uh, queer writings, for example, uh, immediately that led to questions about, you know, uh, is this teacher uh, queer, therefore, for instance, right? I mean, none of this is the case any longer. It's, I think the, the, the young people are, uh, it's partly because of popular culture, it's 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 just something that is just not uh, uh, not a scandalizing issue. Certainly, not not anymore. Um, uh, and uh, we also teach them. Uh, this goes back to, to to the previous question from Grzegorz. Also, in part, uh, we we certainly do teach them. You know, uh, we teach them social constructivism. We teach them deconstruction. Uh, we teach, uh, for example. Uh, Benedict Anderson's um, imagined communities and the fact that indeed the nation is both local and global and it's both modern and, and seemingly traditional and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, those ideas I think are met with, uh, with a lot of uh, acceptance or understanding from the students. Um, anecdotally, I could say that that doesn't necessarily of course, translate into uh, um, you know public discourse or political discourse very immediately or very easily. I think that takes indeed that takes time. So, for example, uh, uh, in a recent or relatively recent comment, the Polish president uh, called the EU an imagined community, and I'm pretty sure he didn't really understand what he was saying, uh, in the sense that he didn't know he was referencing a social constructivist argument about nationality and about you know the, the identity of the nation, uh, but because he was making the opposite argument politically from that. Uh, but but you know I, I I try to make sure that my students understand the the mistake that he made there. So uh, that's my short answer to it. But but I I don't I don't find much resistance. It always almost worries me sometimes. I mean, 15 years ago, I sometimes had a student who would come into my class on, you know, queer theory and would say, um, uh, I'm very right wing, uh, I'm a conservative, I came here in order to learn what you people think. Uh, and I don't see that happening very much anymore. And I wonder whether it's because more students, uh, more, more, more young people are already kind of accepting of those ideas. Um, uh, about gender and sexuality that, that I want to offer in my classes, uh, or whether there is simply, uh, you know, more polarization and they are less likely to actually knock on my door and say hello, uh, as they used to. Thank you, thank you, Thomas. I think that that's also something for, for people um, uh, uh, outside uh, uh, Central Europe to, to think about. I know that I rarely encounter uh, uh, students that come from that perspective, although I do think it's really important to, to get them uh, in our classes. 
Um, so uh, also that was a great uh, question, I think, uh, uh, to end with. Um, I'd like to thank our hosts, 525 and the Amsterdam Center for European Studies, Diverse um, Europe, um, for, for organizing um, this session. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers, um, um, Hadley Rankin, Agnieszka Kocznianska, and uh, Thomas Masuk. Um, very much, uh, uh, it was great to have you here. Uh, it was wonderful um, uh, to listen to you. And of course, I also want to thank all the viewers, uh, the people that asked the questions, but also the viewers um, for their uh, attention. I think that we've, um, well, I've learned quite a bit um, uh, also about these strategies. I think it's really important that we strengthen uh, uh, the EU. Um, we have the elections coming up in the Netherlands, so vote for parties that uh, are pro-European Union. But uh, also very importantly, what I'd like to take home from this session is to collaborate um, with scholars uh, from Central European universities, um, write articles uh, uh, together, apply for funding uh, uh, together. And that's, of course, you can sign a petition, but this is a better way uh, uh, to show your support. Um, and then also finally, what was said, um, um, create these safe spaces, uh, make sure that students uh, can come here and to other uh, countries where the situation is not as bad yet maybe, um, uh, so stimulate uh, uh, these exchanges. Uh, and as always, uh, go forth and spread the word, um, fight misunderstandings about what gender and sexuality studies entail. And this is a job that I think all of us have to do. Once again, thanks everybody for being here. Thanks to my guests and hopefully we'll see you soon in SPY 25. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, bye-bye.